Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. Welcome to episode two of the Astro Guy podcast, the podcast for the amateur astronomer. In this episode, I had a great discussion with Jonathan Eggleston, a West Virginia amateur astronomer who has gravitated to astrophotography. We'll discuss how he got into it, his gear, his processes, his YouTube channel, WV Astronomy, and so much more. I know that I had a great time chatting with him, and I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Carpe Noctum, seize the night. Welcome to the Astro Guy podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool, and it is my pleasure uh, this evening to be joined by Jonathan Eggleston from the YouTube channel WV Astronomy. Uh, Jonathan and I met, uh, well, we met virtually uh, about a year ago, and uh, it's a kind of funny story. Uh, I'd like to say that it all started with a mouse, and when I mean mouse, I mean a tiny little rodent, and I mean tiny. Uh, my, my wife and I were sitting in, in, the, uh, in our home office and a tiny little baby mouse, maybe an inch long, went running by and my wife freaked out and I wasn't real happy about it either. Uh, but I ended up catching the mouse and getting rid of it and there were no more mice, thank goodness. But uh, that prompted us that weekend to empty out the garage. And uh, in doing so, I found some items uh, that I hadn't used in a very long time that I said, you know what, somebody else could make better use of these than me. So I sold off, uh, I had a moonlight focuser and I sold off some uh, meteorites from my collection and I bought some equipment because I was getting into astrophotography uh, again. Uh, I've been doing this a long time and I'd gotten away from astrophotography probably over 20 years ago. And I, I was just starting to get back into it uh, when this happened. And, uh, I ended up purchasing, uh, taking the money that, that I, I got from selling these items, and I went on eBay and I found this beautiful uh, Celestron 8 optical tube assembly, uh, which is just the telescope for those who don't know. That's just a fancy term for telescope. Uh, and Jonathan was selling it. And uh, he was kind of reluctant once I, he accepted the offer to let it go. So uh, he eventually did. And uh, I used that telescope. I, I used it just last night. Um, and it was, uh, it, it's a great telescope and I love it. And, uh, we, we became friends on Facebook and we kind of follow what each other does. And, and that's kind of how we met. So it's a real pleasure to have him here because he does amazing work. Uh, and so Jonathan, let me just ask you a few questions. Um, by day you're, you are a photographer professionally, correct? Uh, yeah, I just recently, uh, my family actually runs a restaurant uh, right down the road from where I live, and barbecue. You know, uh, it's kind of like country, <laughs> country cooking, kind of like a, a like a bar and all that. And uh, nice. yeah, so I've been doing that for you know five years or so, and I just kind of needed to change. I saw a, an ad come up for a, you know for a portrait photographer, and I filled out the application and I got it at the. It's actually at the Greenbrier Hotel. So, um, oh, cool. it, it, it's, yeah, it's a different kind of atmosphere than what I'm used to, but, um, it's, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. I mean, I'm enjoying the, the change. <laughs> and you get to play with cameras all day. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's a plus. You know, <laughs> with, yeah. So let me ask you this. How'd you get involved or how'd you get interested in astronomy? Um, well, I've always just kind of been, you know, really attracted to, you know, watching anything to do with space i don't know i was just growing up as a kid you know watching anything like that had to do with like space or black holes or anything i was just really drawn to that i, I don't know why you know i was just it was just always kind of like there and so for years you know i just watched all these uh, how the universe works and you know it got to a point where i just i couldn't even find another space show that i hadn't seen you know, like an episode of anything, you know, that does with space. I mean, like through the wormhole, all that stuff. And I just kind of 
you know, I would see them doing interviews with these people with telescopes in the background. And I'm like, you know, I've always kind of was interested in that. So I looked up and, you know, just kind of a shot in the dark. I just bought like a cheap telescope, you know, something that I thought looked cool, <laughs> you know, and um, I just so bought it. When did you get your first scope? Yeah. Yeah. It was like uh, probably like maybe two, four years ago. Okay. And it was the Celestron 127 EQ. Uh, um, I forget. It's Power Seeker 127. Yeah. And it was just like, I mean, I love that little thing. You know, it was just, it was so cool just to be able to see things close up, the moon and all that. And uh, I actually got a roommate at the time. Uh, my friend was struggling, you know, going through a divorce. He needed a place to kind of crash for a while. So, we had a spare bedroom we let him move in and he actually had a little refractor like one of the travel uh 70 millimeter like cheap refractors you know and i kind of like i noticed that the quality of looking through his scope and mine was just crazy different you know and i realized maybe mine wasn't as good as i thought so i looked into getting like a uh, eight inch um uh dobsonian and yeah uh I, I kind of learned the sky with that Dobsonian telescope for a whole year. And I started taking pictures, you know, with my cell phone through that. And it just kind of grew from there. It was just an obsession kind of, um, I just had to try to get a better quality image like all the time, just because I wanted to share what I was seeing with other people. You know, it's like, I, I just couldn't believe you could see things like that and take pictures. And I started watching uh, like YouTube channels like Astro Backyard. And I realized, you know, for just a little bit of uh, like, I mean, in a sense, it's expensive. But just starting out, you know, for a small refractor and like a star tracker, it was kind of affordable, you know, if I saved my money a little bit. I mean, and. I actually got lucky and I found a lady at a yard sale that had, you know, that eight inch SCT and a go-to mount and a tier and she had a DSLR camera and a bunch of lenses, a Sigma, nice lens. And she sold me all that for 500 bucks. Wow. So yeah, I mean, I got really lucky. And at the time I was trying to do like imaging and all that. Um, so that SCT telescope, when I would like, try to do long exposures, you know, throughout the night, I would have like, kind of like the image would, I would lose focus throughout the night because like the mirror would move as it, as it tracked the sky, you know? So mm -hmm. at the time it just didn't really fit in what I was, uh, I, it, it didn't do what I, I needed it to do, you know? So, you know, I didn't want to charge too much for it because I got it cheap, you know, and I wanted to kind of like let somebody else get a deal too. <laughs> So yeah, well, thank I was, you. <laughs> yeah, I was reluctant to let it go at first, you know, after, you know, I posted it and it was like a day later, somebody like bought it and I was just like, oh man, do I really want to sell it? And I mean, there's been a few times I was like, I kicked myself for doing it, but at the same time, I always knew that you had it and I see you post your stuff and I'm glad, you know, that somebody that actually is using it got it and somebody that's going to like, you, you seem like someone that would really take care of their things. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoy using it. It's, it's a, it's a fun scope. It took, I actually had a bit of a learning curve with it because getting it collimated is, is, uh, and, and for the people that don't know what that means, that just means getting the, all the optics lined up correctly. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a, not a simple task uh, with the, yeah, yeah. the, this type of, of telescopes, a folded reflector. Uh, it's got uh, a couple of mirrors in it. And it, it's, but it's a beautiful telescope and it, it, the optics are really uh, fantastic. Um, I, I've just been totally pleased with it. It's just a joy to use. Uh, and, you know, I had, I had a mount for it and, you know, uh, but I'm still learning it. Uh, you know, the, that's one of the things about this hobby is you never, you never become, you know, you never hit that pinnacle. You're always striving for that pinnacle. You're always learning yeah. more. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, the progression, I'm sure that, I, I don't know if you want to share some of your pictures a little later on, uh, but we can yeah. go through some of that, that progression. So, uh, what, what made you actually 
well, I guess the reason you got into doing astrophotography was when you bought the scope, it came with a camera. Well, I, I had realized that, you know, I spent like a year with the, uh, with the Dobsonian and taking pictures through, you know, the eyepiece with, I, I just realized that to get the pictures that I wanted, you know, I, I needed a better camera or I thought I did, you know, so I, I went to Rana Center and I actually got like a cheap, you know, or a Rebel T6. It wasn't cheap, but it was like, you know, for me, it was something cheap that day. I could pay 20 bucks and come home with, with a way to take pictures, you know, so I, I got it and, and I put it up to the eyepiece and it was horrible. Like I couldn't get it to focus. My cell phone was better and it was just like. I sat in my house for like a whole month and I didn't even, uh, I didn't even pick it up or use it or anything for a while. And, you know, my girlfriend was like, you know, if we're not going to use this camera, we need to take it back and stop paying on it. You know? So I'm like, all right, I'll play around with it. So that night I took it out and I just kind of took some pictures of my friend standing outside and I saw some of the Milky Way in the background, you know, and I was like, I was just so amazed. You know, it was an accident that I actually captured the Milky Way in that image. And and I was just like, I couldn't believe that I'd had that camera for a whole month. And I, I didn't even know that I could, like, take pictures. So that that really was the, the light bulb moment, you know. And I started doing research on YouTube and I, and I discovered Astro Backyard. And and he was doing a lot of DSLR work with uh, with a wide field refractor. And that's when I, I really like I could sell some equipment, you know, and try to try to put it down to getting like a wide field refractor. Because I realized to get the the telescopes are very misleading uh, when it comes to the box and what you're going to see, you know, so like. I always thought you could like see these nebulas and things like that through an eyepiece, which I mean, you can in, in, in a sense, but there's, there's not going to be a whole lot of color and detail. And, and, and I realized that, Hey, this guy, Trevor Jones from Astro backyard is taking these like beautiful images from his backyard, you know, and, and all he has is this tiny little scope, you know, it looks like, so I was like, I can do that, you know? So, I just saved my money. I ended up selling that, uh, that Dobsonian and the equipment I got from that lady. I, I sold the SCT and I put it towards getting, you know, a refractor telescope. And I think I told you that when I sold it to you, yes. that I was actually, I was, that, that should yeah, put a, me over the mark. You, you went with the, yeah. uh, the Williams, uh, the Williams optic scope, right? Yeah. 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 I went with, I actually had the Z6 or, I went with the Z61 first and I ended up selling that here in over the past six months and I upgraded to the Z81. So, yeah, I mean, it was it's just so it's much. It's called aperture that, fever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's not much of a change right there, but I did have a little longer focal length and, and I did notice a big kind of change in overall brightness, you know, of my exposure time and all that. Um it just kind of fits in that sweet spot. I think it, an 80 millimeter refractor, you know, it's like you, you, you got a good amount of focal length for these really like wide field uh, targets. So right. it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I've been, I've been playing around with the idea. I have a, a Teleview Pronto. It's a 70 millimeter refractor. Oh and yeah. Visually I, it's spectacular. It just gives them, I've had it over 20 years and uh it, it's it's wonderful it's a great telescope the optics are are just superb but it's a doublet it's not a triplet so they're you know photographically there may be some color and uh i haven't tried it yet uh, i i've made one attempt at imaging with it and that was planetary imaging with a uh with a a, a zwo uh planetary cam but uh that's a future project for me. But uh, anyway, um, is there, do you have a favorite thing that you like to have a favorite object in particular that you like to image? Um, yeah, I really like uh, reflection nebulas, um, like that really dark kind of dust, any kind of target that's like a really bright blue with like 
a real opaque kind of purplish cloud around it. You know, those I'm really attracted to those, like the uh, like the Iris Nebula, probably. Um, or there's uh, I actually discovered a new nebula the other day that I've never heard of, and it was like somebody just posted a picture of it on you know the the beginners group on Facebook. And I was just like, I couldn't believe that there was this nebula that I've never heard of. And it's actually like my favorite type, like the reflection nebula, kind of like it's got a little mix of all of them. But I'm pretty excited. And I think that's going to be my next target. Um, but what, what's the name yeah, of it? Um, it's I don't know really what if there's, uh, you know, um, also known as an, or a different name, but it but it's classified as NGC one three three three, I think. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have it. That's picture. okay. I'll I'll look it up right now. All right. So this is this is the image that Jonathan's talking about. So here's the uh, the Wikipedia page on it, but that is the target and uh, the bluish green that's in there, and that that may not be the best uh, palette that they used for this to show this. Um, that greenish blue is light reflecting off of a nearby star. And the red is uh, the, the neb it's, it's all hydrogen gas, but that reddish color is uh, it's emission nebula. It's emitting light uh, because it's, it's energized. It's being, it's being, uh, there's energy there from from stars that are are uh, have just formed or are forming, uh, and that energy is enough to light up that gas, uh, where the blue and the green is reflecting light off of uh, other nearby stars. That's yeah. that's that's a really cool. Uh, yeah, if, and you know what? You... There's so much in Perseus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That dark stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the yeah. and the dark is actually dust. Uh, and that's dust. All, all, all these, the, well, I, I don't want to say all because we can see uh, nebula in other galaxies like uh, Andromeda. But uh, most of these nebulous objects that we image, uh, you know, recently I did that Cygnus image uh, where I had the North American nebula and the area around uh, Seder, um, which is a huge uh, area of emission nebula. Um, but that's all within within the Milky Way, within our galaxy. So that's kind of local stuff, where uh, an object like like uh, uh, you know a galaxy is not. That's that's far away. It's it's in another galaxy, or it is another galaxy. Um, you know, but these things are all within our own galaxy for the most part. Yeah, usually like planetary nebulas are are all in our galaxy. I'm pretty sure most of the nebulas we do see are in our galaxy, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, we yeah. can see hydrogen regions in where, where yeah, the, yeah. which would be nebula in things like uh, M31 and M33, which are are both galaxies, uh, which are up I, up in the I sky actually, now. Yeah, I actually have a picture of M33 if you want to see it. Yep. Let me just stop my share here, and you can show that. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I haven't shared this online yet because, you know, M33, I'm going to, while you're bringing that up, M33 is one of the objects that, especially to new, to, to people that are new to the hobby, um, it, it's very elusive. And when they look at the numbers, uh, you know, magnitude, which is the brightness, uh, which in the last episode of the podcast, I talked about, uh, you know how what that magnitude scale is and and what it means uh yeah. and m33 is pretty bright when you look at its, its magnitude i don't remember what it is offhand but it should be bright but the thing is it's big it's it's about the size or a little larger than the full moon i believe um so that light spread out over a large area oh that's that's stunning and it is called one of, one of its names is the pinwheel galaxy and here you can see why well, this is actually the uh, triangulum. Oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the pinwheel is M101. I you're think. right. That is M101. I'm, I'm mistaken. This is M33. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That's that's spectacular. That's um, it's about a four-hour exposure, 
and this wow. was uh, this is about the field of view. I barely cropped any of this. Can you see it zoomed in like that? Oh yeah, yeah, that's spectacular. Yeah, actually, um, you can see some hydrogen. Here's what Wayne was talking about, and like in other galaxies, you can see uh, these little explosions in the spiral arms here. Those are actually like nebulas that, if you were in this galaxy, you could look and probably photograph closer to those. You know, I'm sure. Wow. But it's that, pretty interesting stuff, and wow, but yeah, spectacular. Um, there was still I kind of still wanted to do a little more processing to that. Um, I mean, it's never you, you never feel like you're quite finished with those. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's trying to find that right balance, and that that's kind of where uh, the artistry of this comes into play because you know these are things that are are really difficult or, or almost impossible to see. Uh, like this with just your eye because your eye doesn't it doesn't store an image and build it up which is yeah, what the yeah. camera does yeah. and and that's the whole point of of astrophotography is that instead of seeing something for a fraction of a second we're exposing the light to that uh a sensor because we don't use film anymore uh we're exposing the light to to a sensor that's got these uh, the easiest way to describe it is a well and there's there's millions of these wells however many megapixels that's how many million wells you have and they yeah. collect photons and uh that that's really how these how any camera any digital camera works and uh you know the the, the we collect as much light in the wells as we can and during the day you can do that in a fraction of a second and you know a thousandth of a second but at night you need hours to capture uh, some of these things because they're so faint. So, um, do you have a favorite telescope or a favorite piece of gear, uh, um, that you use? Um, I don't know if I really necessarily, I mean, as far as my camera goes, uh, um, I can tell you that the thing that had the most like influence on like my overall, like advantage, moving forward in this hobby was switching to the astronomy camera from a DSLR. It was just like um, learning beforehand about what digital noise and, and all that is. It's like, it, it's, it really, it kind of intimidates people, I believe in the beginning because there's so much to learn. There's so much information, you know, with, with using digital cameras and, and understanding and, and how things work and all that that uh i thought i knew what noise was but when i switched to the astronomy camera i could really you know it was such a a, a difference and just the way things looked that I, I was really able to understand and, and and if that makes sense i was able to understand noise and, and and see it more in my regular photography too you know because I don't know. There's there's different types of noise. There's color noise. There's read noise, and and understanding how you know how how to edit them differently and, and get rid of it, and how much to leave in your images, and all that. Because if you if you do too much noise reduction, you get like a kind of a picture that looks you know almost like it was painted instead of like a photograph. You know, so you got to be real careful there. And, yeah, it's it's a balance. It, it really yeah, yeah. is a balance. And the the type of camera, it's funny, you know, just yesterday, a friend of mine asked me, he, he saw some of my pictures and he said, what kind of camera do you use for that? And I said, if you saw it, you wouldn't think it's a camera. And the, yeah, yeah. I know you have the uh, the ZWO. Uh, which one do you have? I have the ASI 183 MC Pro. So it's a one shot color. And, um, and that's a they're, they're beautiful cameras. Uh, ZWO makes a great product, uh, but they're, they're not they don't look like if you didn't know it was a camera, just looking at it, in most cases, you wouldn't know. And yeah, they're, yeah. they're planetary cameras, uh, which I have the, uh, the ZWO, the ASI 462 MC, uh, which is a planetary camera. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a one shot color, but it, it only it's designed to take video for, for planetary imaging. And yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's got a very, very small sensor uh, in it. And that that was part of the learning curve as well, where the the camera you have has a much larger sensor in it. 
but yeah. uh, you know they make the they're 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 really great uh, engineering. Uh, they're not ridiculously expensive. No, um, I, they're surprised me for sure. <laughs> those new ones that the the sixty two hundred they have that's a bit pricey. Yeah, yeah. But what's uh, it like six hundred dollars? I think. Yeah, yeah. They're they're a lot of money, and uh, so 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 your cam. So you really don't have a favorite, but your camera is well, probably it. Well, I'll, I'll I'll take that back. Um, <laughs> now, now that I think about it, my ASI Air Pro is like. I mean, it's it, it's a game changer for me, you know, it, it's there. I mean, I, I spent so many times trying to connect my mount to my computer and plate solving and doing all that. And for for anybody that doesn't know what plate solving is, it's it's where your your mount will actually it's connected to a computer and it will actually take a picture of the sky using your camera and it will figure out where the mount is pointing at in the night sky. So you don't have to basically so you can download software to do that on a computer and you know you have to download different drivers and all this stuff on your computer and i couldn't really i, I followed the tutorial and several different times i just couldn't figure it out you know and so i was using my computer to dither and and auto guide and all that but i couldn't actually plate solve so I did that for a long time and I finally broke down and bought the ASI Air Pro and it's really, uh, all I did was connect everything into it and it just works. You know, you turn a thing on and it will take a picture of the sky, slew right to your target. It, it performs your meridian flip, everything right. for you. Yeah, the, the uh, for people that don't know the, the ASI Air Pro, it's really just a tiny little computer. Uh, it's what probably about what four by six it's, it's not very big right yeah i mean it's it's small it's yeah probably about the size of your fist okay yeah so it's this little box and and you plug you know all your your uh your your things into it you plug your camera you plug your your mount into it uh and it's got a wi-fi connection and it's got st built-in storage so you can go inside where it's nice and warm and you can sit there with a cup of coffee or a beer or whatever yeah. your, your beverage is or sit back and watch TV while your telescope's outside taking pictures for you. And you just program in what you want it to do. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. And it's actually a very inexpensive piece of equipment. I think they're only around, what, 250 bucks? Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, for what they do, you know, they're really, uh, I mean, they're really cheap you know especially considering in this hobby everything seems to be expensive you know it's surprising <laughs> that it's so cheap for for everything it does and i'm glad but i'm glad you know yeah no absolutely absolutely and um yeah i i, I haven't i don't have one of those yet so i'm i'm out there with the laptop and using yeah, yeah. backyard eos to control my canon camera yeah um, and, you know, or if I'm doing planetary imaging, I'm using fire capture to capture the images. Um, and these, these are, are, you know, for the most part, most of the software is free, not all of it. Uh, some of it you have to pay for, uh, but sometimes a one-time license, sometimes it's a yearly thing. Uh, yeah. But the uh, there's a lot of software out there that's free. And, and I want to touch on that. Um, but before we do that, uh, just in, in, if you were to go out tonight, and take a picture, can you tell us about the gear that you'd be using? Um, yeah, I would. Well, I can I either have two choices. I can use like something wide field. I actually still still use my star tracker and like a camera lens a lot, you know, um, because I can really get like with a with the Rokin on 135, I can get like these really wide field shots, you know, but. Yeah, if I was going to go out like I and shoot that NGC one three 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 that we talked about, um, I would take out. You know, I have the EQ six, uh, the Skywatcher EQ six R Pro mount, and I would use That's it. Heavy. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's beefy. I actually, uh, I leave the mount head attached to the tripod. I, I do take the telescope off every time, and I and I carry the mount out. But it's, I mean, it's a struggle usually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have the uh, EQ5, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's a beast. Yep, yep. 
And uh, I also have the, the, like I said, the William Optics Zenith Star 81 and the uh, ASI 183 MC Pro. And it just depends on the target. If I'm shooting something like that Nebula, I'll probably use maybe the, the L Pro light pollution filter. And, and that will, it's basically a broadband filter that, that lets you uh, gather all the natural colors of the night sky versus just narrow band. And, and light pollution, I just want to talk about that for a second. That's a huge uh, a very difficult thing that we have to deal with in this hobby. Uh, I live 17 miles from New York city and oh, yeah. you know, the picture that's behind me is a picture that I took in my front yard. Um, and I actually have deeper images of that, that show even more, but, uh, these filters are what makes that possible. And, uh, just last night when I was imaging, a friend of mine came by and we were outside chatting and he was saying, you know, we'd never, imagine that we'd be able to take images like we were taking and you know that you and I are doing and and you know you're way ahead of me on a lot of this uh but you know when we were kids it was professionals that could do this with big giant telescopes that cost millions of dollars that was the only way to do it and even then they weren't getting the kind of quality that amateurs are getting today it's it's really amazing so so I'm sorry, go back. You're using the EQ6 and the, the, Z, the, the Z, Z81, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I just have on top, I just have a, a 50 millimeter Orion mini guide scope with, a, uh, with the ASI 120mm mini. It's a monochrome kind of planetary camera, um, but it's good for like auto guiding and it, you could actually use that camera for planetary imaging. I have. I've taken a picture of Mars using that. Um, and that was the last picture that I took through that SCT before I sold it to you. Was <laughs> my image of Mars. Um, I might be able to pull it up here. I can show you a picture of my gear here. Okay. Well, here, while you're doing that. Oh, okay. I was going to say I can show you a picture. I, I took a Mars through the. Uh, okay. Here, I'll, let me pop that up real quick. All right. It's it's not going to be huge on the screen, but that's that's taken through the the telescope I got from Jonathan, and uh, that's with the eight inch scope and the planetary camera, and that was Mars last. I'm probably going to say November. Uh, yeah, I think that was November was uh, that when a, I took that. Was that an opposition? It was just past opposition. I think opposition was around August of last year. You know, uh, real quick, a little offshoot story. Um, my local astronomy club that I've been a member of since I was 14, um, I was talking to one of the members who's a friend of mine about, uh, you know, wanting to take some pictures, planetary images. And I, I was using my phone to capture video on on uh, through my ETX, uh, the ETX-125. And I was getting some decent lunar images. And my friend Jim said, well, you know, the club has a couple planetary cameras. He says, I'll let you borrow them. And, you know, you can try it out. So there was a, a it was the ASI, uh, was the, I'm thinking the 224. I forget which model, or the 294. It was the 294 MC. Uh, and then there was, there was, I think it was a 120, uh, not the mini, but it was the regular 120 uh, mm -hmm. monochrome. Yeah. So I played around with those and I started getting some decent images with the uh, ETX 125, which is a five inch scope. And uh, I was happy with them, but I wanted, I knew I needed more resolution. So I knew I had to get something bigger, which is what prompted me to look for the eight inch scope. But uh when I gave those cameras back, uh, I, I now I needed a camera and that was right around the time that the mouse came in. So, <laughs> yeah, right. all right. So I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah. And it's all, uh, I did, I did have the EQM 35 pro mount, but I upgraded to the EQ six because I was having problems with the EQM 35. Here's a picture of, uh, this is the EQM 35 mount that I have. It's, and it's actually a star tracker and a mount. Uh, wow. And it's, it's on the, this is the tier that I bought from that lady at the yard sale. Uh, 
Yeah, and here's the, uh, th this is actually the Z81, and I did a Star Trails kind of picture with that. That's beautiful. Well, that's part of the artistry of this hobby is to, to do images like that. Now, yeah. where, where you live, I know you're in West Virginia. It, we use a, a system called the Bortle system, to, which is named for John Bortle, uh, who's lives not far from here. But uh, it, it's it's a measure of how dark your sky is and it goes from one to nine and where i live it's it's an eight um if you look on the maps it's it's an eight because i'm really close to new york city and in, in the met in the out in the suburbs here you know even though i've got deer all over the place uh the sky's not not that great uh where you, how how dark is it where you are um I've kind of classified it as 2.7, I think. It's kind of in between. Like, because when you look to, I think, the uh, east, yeah, you look to the east and it's pretty dark. You know, it's like, I think it's like Portal 2, maybe to wow. the east. And it's Portal 3, like to the uh, west. So it's kind of like, so when you're shooting, that's kind of in between that. You know, most targets are, are going to, like, pass by that area of the sky. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm very fortunate, you know, and lucky because I understand, you know, Bortle, I mean, that Bortle 8 pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, you, it is. Like it's really bad. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I've never really shot in heavy light pollution. Um I mean, I hate to say that. I feel bad for other people, you know, that, that have never been to a dark sky. But it's like, yeah, I'm very blessed. And I feel fortunate, you know, to live where I live. And, you know, when, when you're under a dark sky, for me, it, it was life changing. I remember the first time I was out in a really, really, really dark sky. And, and the, I'm the darkest skies I've ever seen. I was out fishing. I was out about 60 miles in the Atlantic uh, off the coast. And, you know, there, there were no lights anywhere. Uh, and yeah. you could literally see stars just pop above the horizon and just sink below. It was, it was an amazing sight. I was, I was spent more time looking at the sky than I did fishing. Um, yeah. it, it was, it was amazing, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if going to a dark sky is amazing, we can look up and see the Milky way and, uh, you know, see things like, uh, Andromeda with your naked eye, uh, you know, see another galaxy, uh, and, you know, the, and the Milky Way, which is our galaxy, which, you know, is over most people's heads. Like right now, it's, it's overhead. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, if people go outside and, and it's dark enough, you'd actually be able to see it if it's clear. Um, so uh, now this is a tough question, but in, in, in simple terms, when you have an idea to image an object, what's your, what's your process to get to your I don't want to say finished product because we never really finish, but to get to something that you're proud of it, you'll post it. Um, uh, I basically, you know, the ASI air, like I told you, has, has pretty much made that process a lot easier. But, you know, generally I would, uh, you, you know, I, I start with Stellarium, you know, or I start with the clear sky app to make sure it's going to be clear. Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, check the weather channel just to confer with the clear, you know, I, I do all that first. And then it, when, when I'm sure it's going to be clear, you know, the second thing I do is check the moon phase and make sure, you know, when the moon's going to rise, what percentage of the moon it is, you know, because that affects really what targets I can shoot. So um, if it's some kind of full moon or, or something like that, I'm going to want to pick something that's like a narrow band target. So use something like the Optolong L extreme filter that I have. And it's, it, it, it kind of isolates just the hydrogen and the oxygen gas, which is your, your reds and your blue colors. So, um, you can shoot that basically in a hundred percent moonlight and, and still get a decent image. So based on that, you know, if that will determine what target I'm going to pick, you know, that night and then say, you know whatever i pick it's always the same after that you know it's stick the filter in uh, i take the telescope out uh get get the mount polar aligned you know and and that's a main thing that you you really have to to 
do a good polar alignment, you know, to be able to leave your mount all night and, and not have to babysit it and make sure that everything's centered and all that. You really want to take the time to, to dial in that polar alignment. And that's another thing that's really intimidating to people. It's really not that bad. Uh, once you learn how to do it, it's pretty quick. And um, in my defense for the ASI Air Pro, I, I did spend time learning the sky before I got that thing. So, I mean, I feel like I earned my ASI Air Pro. <laughs> like, I didn't just, like, get it right when I started this hobby and, like, I didn't learn anything. I, I spent, like, probably two years, like, kind of learning the sky and everything I could, you know, before I made that switch. Yeah, but, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how many people in this, in the astrophotography side of the hobby, don't know the sky. You know, yeah, and, and yeah. I know people that, you know, I, I, I'm involved with the telescope making club and, and uh, you know, there have been members there where they're just interested in making optics. They have no interest in using them, which yeah, is the yeah. boggles my mind. If you're going to put all those hours and hours and hours yeah. into making this beautiful telescope, you know, why not use it? But, uh, you know, they, they, they get do the bare minimum, I guess, to get by. Um, so I know that, you know, when we're doing this, um, a big part of uh, imaging isn't just taking the picture. It's what happens after you've collected all those photons uh, yeah. and, you know, you've taken uh, and we don't take a, you know, a four hour exposure uh, isn't just a single four hour shot. It's it's you know, it can be many, many, many shots. I, I, I'm going to be doing a, a future episode about budget astrophotography. And there's an image uh, that I did that's 88 minutes of exposure, but it's 886 second images. So uh, while, you know, if I open my camera for 88 minutes around where I live, even with a filter there, it would be pure white. You know, it'd be totally washed out. So uh, the the real, uh, I, I guess I'm trying to think what's the right word here, but the the once you have all that that data, the 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 light that you've collected, um, you have to process it. And uh, I know that you've talked about using sequitur. Yeah. Um, you want to just talk a little bit about what that is and and what that does? Um, yes. Yeah, uh, I call it sequator. I don't know, sequator. I don't know really what it's called, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it will actually allow you. Uh, it's more for, in my opinion, for like night, like landscape scenes with a sky, you know, versus deep sky imaging. Like I have used it for some of like the stacking like deep sky images, but it, it doesn't allow you to add like bias frames or anything like that. Right. But um, it will let you add some dark frames and, and what that is when you when you take these light frames and light frames are just your pictures of the sky and you when you you want to take a set of dark frames to go to stack along with all that data because you you'll have like noise and different like color noise and stuff added to your image so you want to take these set of dark frames that are kind of just to add and, and help get rid of those artifacts that come along with like digital imaging, you know? So th this, this, uh, sequitur really allows you to do that really quickly. Like add the dark frames, add your light frames, and then it, it will stack all of that together in like a, a couple minutes usually and spit quick. out you know, yeah, it is one, quick. one completed image, you know, that's unprocessed. It's just a raw file and you take that into Photoshop and, you can really fine tune it and, and bring out, you know, all those details. And so stuff. when you don't use sequitur or sequator, uh, what do you use to stack your images? Um, well, when I first started, I started with, it's, it's a software called deep sky stacker uh -huh. and it's a free uh, software. Anybody can download it and it's pretty, uh, it walks you through it pretty much. And it start at step one and tell you what to do to add your light frames and dark frames and all that. And it takes a little longer, but you get, a, uh, in my opinion, you get a better result in the end. Um, but 
after a couple of years of using that, I switched to Astro Pixel Processor. And it's uh, it's a little more involved than Deep Sky Stacker, but you, you get a better result even more than Deep Sky Stacker. So it's just, I guess the next step would be a software called PixInsight, which is like full astrophotography like processing it's designed for astrophotography so i think you can really get a lot more out of your image that uh your data with using a software like that but i haven't made that step yet i use astro pixel processor it's pretty self-explanatory too I, I keep everything on the default i just click you know next next and i load them in it's real it's really easy and uh, it's pretty a lot of people are intimidated by that software too but it's it's really simple and yeah it, it i mean you can you can manually stack the data in photoshop but it it would just take forever to stack you know hundreds of pictures and you have to to use some kind of software to do stuff like that so, so right. and that so you use astro pixel processor which is the one that I've been been using, and I do the same thing. I just stick to the defaults and, and follow it. But those the tools at the end are actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, to, yeah. to remove light pollution and vignetting and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then once you're done with Astro Pixel Processor, um, I, I know for me, I bring it into GIMP, which is like a, a free version of Photoshop. Yeah. Um, but what what do you use for that? Uh -huh. I use Photoshop, yeah. And I actually, uh, I jump back and forth between Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw. And it kind of, it, it's a, a filter inside of Photoshop. So you can just, if you have Photoshop, you have Camera Raw too. You just can choose the filter tab and open Camera Raw. And it actually gives you sliders like noise reduction sliders, contrast slider, you know, it's just a, a menu of sliders that you can tweak back and forth. And it, it just makes doing a global adjustments to your image pretty easy. And I don't know, I've never used GIMP. I just, I pay the monthly subscription for Photoshop. It's like $10 a month or something. And I don't know. I just, because when I first started, I was following tutorials by like Astro Backyard. So, you know, I wanted to have the software he had, you know, because I just felt like he was the best and I, I wanted to like, I don't know. I just, he's, I really liked the, the quality of his images, you know, and I felt like I needed, if I wanted to follow his tutorials, I needed to have what he had, you know. He takes great, yeah. The, the images on on his website are fantastic. Uh, Astro Backyard. That's what, and, and you know, it's funny you mentioned that, and that was actually the next thing I want to talk about was the different resources uh, that that we use. I know one of the ones that I have relied on quite a bit um, is Cloudy Nights. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Cloudy Nights. It's a it's a forum. Uh, there, it's actually has a great classified section. Uh, that's where I got my uh, hydrogen alpha modified dslr that i use um and i picked up a few other things on there as well uh and sold quite a few things on there um it's and you're all you know the only thing that's there it's all astronomy stuff um but there's all these different forums whether if you're into planetary if you're into double stars and not just imaging it's observing and you know getting started and there's even even some you know there's a whole forum just for you know talking about pets <laughs> you know people's pets um so resources like that and and i know for me astronomy clubs uh i, I was fortunate when i was a uh, you know just growing up uh i lived three blocks away from the local community college and there's a, a an observatory there with two world-class telescopes in it there's a, a 24 inch uh richie Crichton, uh which is a, a you know, back then, actually, it wasn't that good. The The optics had some flaws, but the, the optics have been redone. And uh, that telescope is, is pretty fantastic. And then uh, there's a 10 inch F15 refractor that's there as well. That was built by club members in the 1960s. And uh, uh, it was one of the first telescopes in the world that used uh, computer uh, computers to help with the figuring 
of the of the lenses. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, to have one of the people involved in doing that uh, on a future podcast. Uh, he he's a uh, very active imager. Does a lot of mostly planetary imaging, but he does some uh, spectroscopy and and some other things that are uh, pretty deep into the hobby. But uh, hopefully I can get him to come on. I was actually talking to him about it today on, on Facebook. So maybe that'll happen. Um, and, you know, there's other clubs in New Jersey. It's such a densely packed state that, uh, you know, you don't have to go too far to find an astronomy club. So I grew up right around the corner, basically from one. Uh, and over the years, I've gotten involved with, with some other ones. There's one in Vermont that I'm, I'm pretty active with or, or was very active with, uh, obviously, since the pandemic. I'm certainly not. And, uh, you know, life gets in the way of doing our hobbies sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think uh, what what do you have? I know you, I, you just talked about your, your the uh, NGC 1333. Um, is there any new equipment that you're you're looking to add? Um, yeah, I'm actually um, I'm thinking about trying to get a 20 millimeter uh, 1.8 camera lens um, just for more like landscape kind of stuff. I'm getting more into you know nightscape images versus just deep sky imaging. Um, I've been learning from you know a buddy of mine that i've learned on the or i met on the facebook groups and he's been teaching me a lot of like you know about composition and stuff like that so and with the new job you know i'm learning more about composition so i'm getting more into like wanting to kind of move move not so much exclusively just deep sky imaging so um i've been saving for that lens and i'd like to get a drone but I mean, I, who, who doesn't want a drone? You know? <laughs> They're fun to play with. So the, the one thing that I just want to talk about real quick, that it, it's a really important piece of, of what we do. Uh, and it's, it's, I know I found it pretty challenging at first, although it's gotten easier over time, is actually getting the image in focus. And when you're focusing on something, especially with a camera lens, that infinity setting on the camera lens is usually yeah. not really at infinity. Um, and you have to try to find exactly where that is. So we use a tool and you know what the tool is. Yeah, yeah. Which the is, which is a, the bottom of mask. mask. And uh, I have one here. This is actually the one for my uh, Teleview Pronto. Oh, nice. And, you know, you can buy them. They're not expensive. Uh, it, it's, I'll hold it up to the camera here. It's, it's just got these these lines cut into it and it, it takes the starlight and causes diffraction spikes and it creates three of them uh, because there's three sets of lines. And uh, when the, the three lines all intersect perfectly, uh, you know, the, the center line is right through the middle of the other two, then you know that you're in focus. And it, it really is that easy. Um, and if you're, you know, they're, they're inexpensive. You know, they sell them online. You can probably buy them. Uh, I, I think I paid $20 for the one that I got yeah. for the C8 on, on cloudy nights. This did one, not, what's did that? I not, did, did I not send you a Botnov mask with that nope. telescope? No. Um, no. I had made one for that, and I, I thought I'd put it in that box. Uh, um, but, yeah, I spent, like, a couple of days, like, with an X-Acto knife. <laughs> Well, you know, own. you know what I did. I actually had a uh, another one made for another scope. Uh, I I put something on Facebook in, in the local dad's page. Um, I asked if anybody had a three D printer and if they would do a project for me, and I would pay for the wire. Um, and there was a guy that said he would do it. Uh, I I told the guy I'd pay him for the plastic, and he said, "I ah, don't worry about it." It was like you know three dollars worth of wire, so. Uh, I, I got that for free, and this one, I uh, actually went to the local library, and I made a $5 donation, and they printed this up for me. So that's a, a great tip uh, is, you know, ask around if somebody has a 3D printer. Um, you know, they can print it for you, and it's, it, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap it up for now, but uh, tell us a little bit before we do that. Let's just tell everyone a little bit about your, your YouTube channel and what, what you're doing with it. Okay. Um, let me touch one more thing on that focus. Okay. Um, 
uh, I will say it's easier if you go out during the day and focus on a really distant object before you do the the thing at night with the button off mask because uh, people think that you know even at night when you're pointed at a bright star that you're going to be able to see it in there and sometimes you can't and, and and you just keep turning that knob and you just can't find that star so what i find really useful during the day is focus on like a tree really far away or something like that and then when you go out there at night and put your bat knob mask on you'll actually see the star in in, in the field of view you know so just a, just a little tip, you know. That's an excellent, excellent point. It makes a big difference, you know, and, and it's one of those little things people forget to mention and, and it easily gets overlooked, but it's uh, it really helps out a lot. So, you know, just the other day, I, I watched your most recent video on, on WV Astronomy, and it's, it's really cool. Uh, and you were talking about uh, imaging the Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about some of your videos and what, what you're trying to do, because I found it really, really useful, especially as a, I, I, you know, I've been doing this for, I've been, I've been considering, considered myself an amateur astronomer since I was about seven years old. So I've been doing yeah, this yeah. a long time, but yeah. I'm, I'm a newbie. Uh, I'm really a, a beginner when it comes to modern astrophotography. So yeah. Yeah. tell us about uh, your channel. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, about a year ago, you know, I just, uh, I downloaded an app on my phone that was just, you know, a video editor app. And I just kind of like took a couple videos of me out there with the telescope. And, uh, it was really easy just to stitch these videos together and like add some music. And it, it just, it became like, I, I was when I take pictures, I post them on Facebook and, you know, I share them with people and it just I, I needed something else to like kind of like feel uh, it just wasn't enough anymore, you know, and, and I felt like I wanted more people to see what I was doing, you know, because like I told you before, it's just like it's a really good feeling when you're out there and just the, being able to see this stuff, you know, I, I kind of wanted to share that with people and you know, the app made that really easy. And I just kind of started playing around with it like that and uh, doing these short videos. And I was just like, you know, if I don't really move on to a YouTube channel, you know, there's what's the point of all these videos? Nobody's going to see them or anything like that. So I needed a way to share them with people. So that's really why I started the channel. And, you know, the kind of just show my friends and family they 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 were always really fascinated with what i was doing you know i just kind of wanted to share that with them and, uh, you know I, I try to cover things that not everybody's covered and, and try to make them a little more artistic than just a regular tutorial you know and you know I, i'll do some kind of like just editing tutorials but they're in fast forward with some music you know and and kind of like just different things. I, I'm not, I, I would like to maybe get more into like the tutorial and, and showing step-by-step. Step. There are a few videos on there like that, but um, yeah, for the most part, what you can find on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, it's just me, you know, vlogging, you know, what my adventures and just different things that I learned along the way. And yeah, it's fun. I mean, it, it, it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm really glad you do it, and uh, I, I subscribed. I've subscribed a while ago uh, to your channel, and I've I've recommended it to some other people. Um, it, there's some some really great content there, and uh, I expect that over time it's going to grow, and uh, and you'll be putting more content uh, on there, and it's helpful. I know you know for me it was going on YouTube and searching how to, how to do something and for something as detailed as taking a, a you know, multi-night exposure of a very faint object out in the universe. Um, there's YouTube videos that can help and there's not going to be one for everything, but uh, the more people that, that do it and share it, the better it's going to be for everybody. So uh, I, I recommend to everybody who's listening or, or watching uh, WV Astronomy, subscribe, uh, check it out. And uh, Jonathan, again, I want to thank you very much 
uh, yeah. for coming on and spending the time. It was a real pleasure to, to actually talk to you face to face. And, you know, I just I just hope that, uh, you know, you keep it up because uh, for somebody who's only been doing this for four or five years, I'm blown away by the quality of, of images that you get. And again, I, I just want to thank you. Subscribe to Jonathan's channel and uh, yeah. that's all for this episode. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope that you've found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash astroguypod. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Since we're just starting out, there won't be much content, but stay tuned. I promise there'll be more coming. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe noctum. Seize the night.